because they used ingenuity, they used the best visual um, uh, creativity you could possibly do, and then uh, with the human story, this village that uh, was uh, understanding that they needed to evolve. It's just a beautiful story. Let's start with you, Mike. What, what touched you about this film? Well, first, uh, really thank you. Um, Louis is good at what he does, but he tells a great story. And if you look at the history of sapiens, not, not the history of man, but the history of us, we are collectively powerful because we embrace stories. And, and Louis done that. And if we can change this narrative, if we can embrace this story that restoration is an alternative to extinction, then the disappearances can stop. But what you have to recognize that an individual won't make a big enough difference. We have to move collectively. And please be mindful, at least in this country, one of the best ways of moving collectively is through our electoral process. And Louis had an image in his film that said, elect green candidates. How you vote matters. Uh, you, you may see in this country one party that will be unwilling to speak about climate change, for example, in reasonable terms, one party that would work hard to gut the Endangered Species Act. I would hope that he would find that approach to us moving forward absolutely unacceptable. So be mindful, you're looking for your thing, it could be casting an informed vote. I have the good fortune to also serve in the Montana Senate, so I know the power of electoral politics, and I'm so pleased that Louis felt compelled to point out we should vote for Green Cannon. It's a great, it's a great story, it's a sad story, I wish it was never needed to be told, but we move for, forward through stories, and, and uh, we can change the story if we choose. Thank you very much. Jim, what about you? I think one of the, the things that struck me was, was the quote that we can't lose hope. This is such a big story and such an overwhelming story, um, but, but we have to be able to tackle it, and each of us can make a difference. You know, in this last Congress, over 85 bills or amendments uh, were introduced to gut the Endangered Species Act or to uh, weaken the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. Uh, at Defenders of Wildlife, one of the things we're doing is trying to help people understand that we, we can't stand for that today. Uh, each and every one of us has a responsibility to inform our elected officials that, that we won't take it, um, that, that this is important. It is an important step for us now. It's an important step for the next generation. Uh, we've got to leave this planet better than we found it, uh, and, and we can do it if we step up. Now, in the last uh, presidential election, climate change was not even on the radar, and it seems to be with the tipping point and with the, with, look at the California wildfires right now and, and all the things that are going on, that, it, that people are paying more attention to it. Uh, just look at the records that we're setting with heat. So um, thank you very much um, for those thoughts. Jim, we'll turn to you, Suzanne. Well, I think if, if I look at the faces of those children in Indonesia in the village, or whether it's it's in a, a factory in China or um, anywhere around the world, you imagine that that among that sea of faces, there could be the next Elon Musk, there could be the next Ted Turner, there could be a, amazing, passionate uh, wisdom uh, among those children, and we have to help frame the the issue around extinction in a way that can connect with them personally. And so I think that's a big part of what Captain Planet Foundation has, has really got strengthened in their work over 25 years of funding children's pro led projects around the world, uh, environmental projects, and where we're trying to go with Project Endangered Species is to connect children in that place where they live with the species that are around them and understanding the wonder of that life and how much their life connects with that. And, and to help them use that as an activation point to connect with their heart and to, to use that as an experience to build the skills that they need to actually do something about it and to get that empowerment. So I think that's really where I'm excited is to see these kind of projects that have the potential to touch so many millions of kids around the world. Speaking of kids, uh, Carter and Olivia, um, Carter, tell people about um, the reaction you get. You've, you've, you did a letter writing campaign to South Africa to help save the rhinos. And you've done so many things, and you talk with kids. What's the reaction that you get from your generation? Well, you get kids that are all over the world that care so much about 
things like this, like about different endangered species, plastic pollution, mm -hmm. and all the things like that. But then you get some kids who don't understand. And that's where we come in. We try to educate all these different people, all these different, all the youth. And I'll see the, the kid going back home and explain to their parents. And like um, in the movie, it said that one t uh, candle. If you have that one candle and you come across someone else with a candle and you light it, it's just making more light in the dark. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to spread that light so that we can raise awareness about what's happening. And I know that you all got it interested in this campaign with uh, Olivia. You were, you adopted a cheetah, and you didn't know why a cheetah needed to be adopted. So I know that probably watching the animal in this film was difficult for you. Um, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, it was definitely difficult for me to watch most of these animals, even though I've seen so many images and videos of perfect stuff. This still touched me, and it makes me want to do more than I'm actually doing. Well, um, I want to talk about uh, some more, more solutions, um, because there is so much that's going on out there. I, I recently heard from an expert in China. There is only one nonprofit in all of China that has enough power to try to uh, bring things to their government for change. And think about all of the power we have in our country, so many conservation groups doing so many things. Louis mentioned Peter Knight's Wild Aid campaign. Uh, I know Peter, and those, his uh, PSA, those in your face PSAs, that's, that was just one example, have been changing the behaviors uh, of people in China. These are ancient traditions, as we know, that go back uh, generations. They were, they put these PSAs uh, in the Beijing airport. I mean, they're kind of all over the place. So there is a lot that uh, we can do with the power of things like this. Sadly, traditional media is not doing enough. I can say CNN International is doing 100-day countdown to COP21. We're doing different climate stories every week. Tomorrow, I'm doing a story on the uh, sad story that the sockeye salmon that are currently uh, trying to spawn up the rivers of uh, Oregon and Washington are dying by the thousands because the water is too warm. It's too hot and um, thousands are not going to make it. So let's just talk about the, the power we can have other than the voting booth, very important. What are some other things? Eat less meat, <laughs> try to eat more plants and stuff. But what are some other campaigns that some people here may not know about, the work that you're doing? Well, uh, and, and we, we don't, uh, with the Turner Endangered Species Fund, we don't work on food habit issues. But, and I know Natalie spoke to this, but it bears repeating. Now, what you eat matters. F well, meat is a very expensive food, ecologically uh, and monetarily, but tonight we'll focus on the ecology of it all. Just simply eat less meat. That will make a profound difference. And just in the United States, it would make a profound difference. And that's something you can do each and every day. Uh, I think, Louie, you have a quote. People that drive Hummers and are, what is it? Uh, a vegetarian driving a Hummer uses less energy than a meat eater on a bicycle. A vegetarian driving a Hummer uses less energy than a meat eater on a bicycle. Okay, so that's kind of get behind the thing. So, what else um, are you doing at um, your defenders? Yeah. Uh, so, defenders is, is a national organization focused on trying to help protect uh, native animals and plants in their natural communities. We have about 1.3 million members and supporters around the country working to try and protect. Uh, the North American species. Uh, we partnered with the Racing Extinction film. At the end of the film, you saw a website that came up for one of the organizations that will be working with the Racing Extinction film to try and give people actions that they can take. Um, they'll be able to take uh, advocacy-based actions to try and, and help uh, protect the species. Uh, there, there's partnerships with um, uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium to look at uh, better choices for seafoods that you can eat. Um, pledges or ideas uh, for people to work together as families uh, to help protect coastal environments if you live there. Um, there are a number of uh, opportunities that Defenders and other organizations will be using uh, to try and help move this film forward. Uh, just in the, the few weeks that this film has been piloting, there have been 50,000, I believe, or so actions that have been taken uh, by people who have seen the screenings or talked to other people uh, and shared the words. So we're hoping as the film opens this week, 
uh, we can really capitalize and, and get some social media and, and movement move, uh, going forward. Yeah, we're already talking up, because I am so curious now to see how our country and beyond react to this film. It's just so amazing, uh, everything that they point out. It's so comprehensive um, mm -hmm. of the issues. Um, Suzanne, um, you talked about the things that the Capital Planet uh, is doing as far as um, awareness and things, and even uh, school gardens that they promote. And I've got stories with kids in school gardens. It's amazing. A very outreach school in New Orleans, a charter school that has a school garden, is changing the way these children um, who don't have access to healthy food uh, or want to eat more broccoli and things like that. Exactly, and I think that's something that's been a really successful approach over the last two, three years, I guess, with Captain Planet Foundation and their Project Learning Garden and, and certainly many other partners that are working in, in this space, but, but starting to help to connect children with, with where food comes from and, and to really integrate it in a way that is not just a, a put a garden bed in your schoolyard, but let's build curriculum around that. Let's help, help educate the teachers so they can start to understand how to take these children into, into the garden at their science lab and to use that in a, a much more hands-on learning approach and to, to start to bring tastings of those produce items into the classroom. So it, it does start to change those, those tastes and those eating patterns and habits and the kids can go home and, and ask why the parent is not necessarily purchasing in a way that reflects the values that the child is learning. So I think it's a great potential ripple effect from those, those types of problems. Absolutely. Uh, at my son's school, they, uh, the uh, farmers came in and brought carrots at Eat River, and the kids just couldn't believe that carrots came out of the ground that day. <laughs> and, and what they can make from that carrot, and that they made things from that carrot, and it was fascinating uh, to watch how that can change. And um, I know that visuals are very important, and we learned that in this film. Um, I dressed as the Pacific Ocean for uh, Eco Day at my son's school. I basically safety pinned about 80 pieces of plastic to my clothes and made the kids guess who I was and then showed them pictures of what happens when animals um, ingest plastic and such. So what kind of visuals do you use in your work? And, and if you didn't know this, they've got this brilliant website, it's OMJ, <laughs> onemoregeneration.com because they want their generation to be the ones that make sure we take care of this. So the visuals that we use are, we don't try to like terrify the kids. We don't try to put them into like like a shock or something. Um, we've, we have had like um, rhino poaching, for example. We definitely don't show that because the poachers there will literally hack off the face to get the rhino. And we just, I can barely handle it. And, but the visuals we use is like, especially plastic pollution. Uh, the albatross. They, the mothers will go to the ocean and will see something shiny and think it's a fish, go down and scoop it up and it happens to be like a plastic cap or um, a plastic bag. And they regurgitate it into the, um, into the babies. And 40% of the baby albatross dies in the first year of being born just because of plastic pollution. And we explain this to the kids. We also explain about entanglement um, with dolphins and uh, being caught, uh, like the, the manta ray, being caught with like the net and the hook. That, that, we show them pictures like that explaining how just a simple, as simple as getting a plastic bag and throwing it away can end up in the ocean and cause a, uh, an animal to die. So those are some of the visuals we use. And the fish nets are causing problems uh, around the world um, for animals. And we see a lot of those on Facebook, and I always share it every time someone rescues an animal like we saw here. Maybe yeah. um, We try to um, teach the children based on their level. Um, if they're in kindergarten, we try not to really show too much graphic, but we try to teach them in a way that they understand. And some of them might want to go home and um, help by starting like a mini eco club or um, something on their level that they can do. Children get it, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> They're coming up at a different time. It takes us all a while to kind of get it. I, years ago, was a reporter in Orlando and was uh, assigned to cover a uh, birth of a baby killer whale at SeaWorld. And it was all very exciting. We were told to be quiet, you know, but um, in the end, you know, we've, we've come a long way. We've all saw, hopefully, uh, blackfish that CNN covered over and over. And, 
you know, I feel a little bit differently about covering that story in this in this day today. And um, uh, I also want to say that uh, that that bird. I don't know about you guys, but the bird story struck me. Um, Twenty years ago, uh, I was covering NASA, and um, we went with wildlife officials, very much like Louie did and his team, to the Mare Island Wildlife Refuge, which is right next to the launch pad. And I really wasn't expecting uh, what was going to happen. I just knew that we were going with two wildlife officials, a cameraman and me, um, to see if there was this bird left that they felt was extinct. And they had a clipboard, a stamp that said extinct, and a tape recorder. And they played it three times. And if no bird answered uh, on the third time, um, they would mark it extinct. And I remember it was just so quiet and beautiful in that marsh. I could hear a cameraman's tape rolling uh, in his video camera. And sure enough, uh, nothing answered. And they marked it extinct. That is one of the saddest stories I've ever done in 30 years um, of doing a lot of sad stories. And I want to let you guys know that um, I would forgotten the name of that bird. And I was having a lunch with um, Pierre Howard, one of our leaders in Constantinople. Conservancy here in Georgia, and he's a top bird in the country. And I said, Pierre, I'm just so sad that I can't remember the name of the little bird. I did a story on it in one second. He goes, The dusky seaside sparrow. <laughs> <laughs> the dusky seaside sparrow. We can use. Uh, exactly. And I do want to point out, too, that the uh, frog pod that you guys saw, did you recognize where that was? Yes. Atlanta Botanical Gardens. I've been there, too. It's a fascinating, fascinating place, and they're trying to do wonderful things. Um, I mean, what, what more can you say about everything this film covered? I mean, I just don't know what they didn't cover. And I, I look forward to seeing so much what the reaction is in China and places. I know that um, in Japan, uh, you've had very good reaction among most of the Japanese, um, giving it um, standing ovations and such. Um, he's not a hated man in Japan at all. But are there any closing comments you'd like to say? I would like to, I'd like to make one point. Uh, the extension crisis is very much a choice. It's a choice that we make every day, and it's, it's a choice that makes no sense on any level. If you're a person of faith, uh, it would seem that your love of the Creator would prompt you to love the creation. And, and if you're a secular humanist, uh, it would seem that if you rely on facts, uh, that we know it's the wondrous diversity of life on earth that provides for all of our needs. This problem is a choice that makes no sense. So why don't we choose different? I hope as a society. I hope as a society we can be optimistic that, that we've got the vision and the foresight uh, to leave our country a stronger place, uh, to elect officials who will be wise in the choices that they make and that we as a country will stand up and say, this is important, this is our heritage, this is part of who we are, uh, and, and we will say it. The project that I mentioned that we're developing, and I neglected to mention that that is in partnership with every organization represented here on the stage and a dozen other partner organizations, um, is really going to be looking at how we can help children to connect with the powers that they have to become a hero for a species. And as part of the way that we feel we can be successful in that, we've got to build an army of other heroes that can be there to support them. Adults who are heroes in their own way, in their own lives, whether it is acting as a scientist or whether it's being an activist. Um, and we will be out there recruiting for other heroes to be a part of this system as we build it to, uh, to give those models for other kids. So please, if you're interested in supporting that, um, get in touch with us, we'd love to have you be a hero in this program. How can people support One More Generation? Uh, can I say something before you <coughs> came in? Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I was realizing on the film, people were talking about how people just wait for other people to do something about it, to do something about the issue. And we were talking to someone uh, who CNN did a report about um, who killed the black rhino. Uh, and he paid $350,000 to kill the black rhino. And 
we are asking them what what number is too low to stop killing these rhinos or to stop killing any species. His response was three. Just three of the rhinos left. We need to we need to start like stopping this now. We can't wait until then because then it's practically over. We have like almost zero chance of bringing them back. So I just wanted to say that. And I also love the car, by the way. Olivia, you just let me talk. Um, well, I wanted to say thank you, Mr. Lilly. And um, honestly, if I were to do that, I probably couldn't let that guy um, kill that man, right? I, I just wouldn't let it happen. Um, so I don't think I could ever do that. Um, so I want to say thank you for that um, film. Oh, raising awareness about the issue. And um, one of our main messages of One More Generation is that anybody can make a difference. If we can, you guys can too. So that's what we do at every speaking engagement. To Carter's point, I interviewed uh, Sir Robert Swan, an Arctic explorer, who said that he's a only guy stupid enough to walk to both the North and South Pole. <laughs> um, but he was on a campaign to go around the world to talk with college students about these issues. And he, I said, are they listening? He said, no, they're busy on Facebook and iPod. This was a few years ago. And I said, well, come to my son's school. That's people your age. But they're listening. And he just goes, too late. And I don't mean to say that it's not hopeful. We have hope. But as Louie pointed out in this film, it, the time is now. We're the ones that have to do it. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out. I want to close by saying that um, last year, my son and I went on an excursion. You've probably done this and to see whales, and I didn't think we'd see anything. Like, you know, we're not going to see anything. And we saw a blue whale off the coast of California. And do you know that 90% of the people on the planet will never see one in their lifetime? Mm -hmm. We went back and Googled it, and the size of a heart of a blue whale is the size of a VW bug. <laughs> I think we got the impression how big it is from the way he portrayed it in the beginning of this film. But Thank you to Louie and your team, um, and thank you for bringing it to us today. I think we've all been very touched, and march on. Okay. Yeah.